Welcome to another episode of This Catholic Life, conversations about life's ups and downs, big and small, how we deal with every situation imaginable, whatever life throws at us, but still manage to be sensible, practical, and joyful. Today's show, hopefully, will focus on the joyful side. This is called Laughter for the Soul, a kind of a spin-off on chicken soup for the soul, but this is about how laughter can actually be good for us in body and soul. Uh, about humour, comedy, and weird things that make us laugh what, and where laughter fits into Catholic life. I'm your host, Peter Holmes. Today I'm joined by Renee Kohler ryan my co-host and professor in philosophy at the University of Notre Dame. Hello, Hello Renee. Peter. And by my co-host also, Ryan Galliott, artist, resident geek, and our co-host today. Hello. Before we get started, just a reminder that if you like the show, you should write us a review on iTunes, not just the star feedback, but the review itself, that the more reviews we get, the more people get to know us. So let's get into the topic. Laughter uh, is good for the soul. It's a big claim. I wanted to start by asking what kinds of laughter there are, because there seems to be uh, that you can laugh in a positive way and you can laugh in a negative way. We we did a show on kind of mental health and bullying, and sometimes laughter can be actually a weapon used Mm. against us, mockery, that kind of thing. But it could be an expression of joy, uh, laughing at something amusing um, or just laughing as therapy. Or as a coping mechanism, what kinds of laughter can we think of? I think one can laugh just when one is delighted at something. Like yes. It's kind of like surprised delight. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. I was gonna say, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. almost and pure it joy, isn't it? it? Yeah. yeah. Laughter is one of those things. It's so um, it's so physical and spiritual at the same time mm. that it kind of comes from somewhere that's you but not you. Yeah. It's mm. yeah, an interesting thing. Mm. You were going to say? No, I was going to say the same thing. Oftentimes, I mean, I live with five kids and and. Oftentimes, I'm just surprised at what they do. Yeah. <laughs> end up laughing. Sometimes you can't uh, laughing, and the child looks at you and says, "This is serious." <laughs> you laugh even more because it's, <laughs> it's so serious. Sometimes uh, you can laugh at just how ridiculous the situation is as well. Yeah. So last night I came home. I was so tired. I had so much still to do, <laughs> and I was trying to because it was the only night I was going to be home. So I was like, I'll make dinner. But everything went wrong. So stuff was <laughs> falling on me. I realized I hadn't put the cord into the rice cooker, which why it w- was why it wasn't working. The last time a rice cooker didn't work was because it was broken. Mm. So I was like, oh, great. And I've already put all of the stuff in and everything else. <laughs> and then it just kept on going on and on and on. And then I went to put a load of wash into the dryer and I couldn't open the dryer door. And I just started laughing. I was like, all right, Lord, what are you trying to tell me here? Is there something, you know, what is the universe? up to i don't understand sometimes when we watch someone else go through a series of misfortunes it can seem hilarious to us now why is it that we find for example um i think woody allen is the guy that said um comedy so tragedy is when i break a fingernail comedy is when you fall into an open sewer and die (laughs) um so this old idea that someone else like if i watch my daughter cooking and she drops the flower on her head she actually pulled the flower out of the cupboard this is in an old house and um some flower fell on her head and she was covered. Oh. <laughs> Just thinking about it makes me laugh. <laughs> she looks around at me with this deadpan look, which was supposed to be a glare of don't you dare laugh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it just made it funnier. <laughs> so, the, um, the expression of... Um, just humour in, in the ridiculousness of the situation. Yeah. yeah. And it doesn't feel like laughing. Sometimes you don't feel like laughing when you're the one in the situation, but uh, sometimes you just can't help but yeah, that's give right. in to the laughter. That's right. Well, it was also when I found out that the most stolen uh, item from Kurong apparently was the What Would Jesus Do bracelets. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I just thought that was hilarious. <laughs> that's great. Apparently he likes bracelets. <laughs> 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 oh, dear. Hmm. Uh, I had a, a priest friend who used to send me memes with cars on it, and it was WWJD, but it was what would Jesus drive? <laughs> <laughs> it just, when people take something a little bit ridiculous and make it a bit more, it makes it more funny. Yeah. Um, in terms of um, laughter as a coping mechanism, it seems like there's a lot of comedians who are often the very funniest people in the business. Robin Williams comes to mind. Um, he's so funny, but he... he publicly and uh, clearly struggled with mental health mm. issues. And it seems that a, a high level of um, comedians struggle with mental health issues. And this is a coping mechanism they've used very early on. Mm. Uh, and often they have a very dark kind of uh, background to that. And they've used humor as a coping mechanism and quite generously shared it with many other people. Um, what, I wonder what, if there's something in humor that actually responds to suffering. 
I think there's an elephant. 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 <laughs> there we go. I like the elephant. Speaking elephant. Of ridiculous In the room. There it is. Don't mention it. <laughs> we um, weren't going to talk about it. Yeah. I think there's an element there where uh, when things break from the norm, there's always a capacity right. for humor. And it's just how we take it, you know. But mm. uh, Robin Williams is well known for saying that, you know, it's, it's because he understands that suffering that he doesn't want other people to... He wants to say. alleviate something. So he wants yeah. to alleviate, mm. yeah. So Stephen Fry is someone who's very similar in that respect right. as well. Yeah. yeah, he's. I mean, he's an incredibly intelligent person, mm. but clearly has, is coping with a lot of stuff too. Yeah. yeah. There's interesting, a lot of these um, comedy things not only are, you know, promulgated by and people who are comedians are, are suffering from these um, mental uh, distress, uh, but people who also struggle with depression quite often look to those people as inspirations and um, and help. Hmm. Uh, it's worth mentioning that laughter therapy has become a thing recently. Hmm. Now, now I, when I looked this up, I thought, surely they're joking. But, but here's, a, here's a little brief history. Um, a guy called Norman Cousins apparently was a political writer and developed a potentially fatal illness and it was a lot of pain involved in it and mostly the pain dragged it down. Um, and, but he found that 10 minutes of good, solid laughter a day gave him two hours, up to two hours, of pain-free sleep. Mm. And that was when all other things were considered. Now, because he, he published this on his own sort of – he was publishing his own journey, I think it was on a blog or something like that. But uh, a fellow called Dr. Madan Kataria in 1995 actually released a study demonstrating that your body – uh, insofar as the biological responses to laughter can't tell the difference between faked and real laughter, mm. as in it responded the same in terms of your bodily reactions to laughter. And so some of the positive benefits, such as the release of, of whatever chemicals are released in laughter, happen. So people from that have actually developed something they call laughter yoga. Now, of all the See, th this is just a whole <laughs> ball of wrong. Because what you're telling me here is that my body can do something without my spirit. So that's already yep. problematic. Excellent. And that somehow this is good for all of me. So this is like materialism. Imp like, this is not Catholic. I'm glad you did that. And you just said yoga, which is not Catholic. <laughs> which is a trick thing. Which, yes, it is. It We're going to do. have to do an yep. episode on Pilates, yoga. Pilates, yes. Yoga, no. It's so really simple. Perhaps I should say what laughter yoga is before we go there because it's about the least spiritual thing I've ever seen. It's basically kind of breathing and physical exercises to stimulate um, laughter. So they literally clap hands going ha, ha, ha. So it's also <laughs> unintelligent. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, yes. yes. And, and okay. to be honest, you have to there get There is no the humour in this at all. <laughs> it's, this is what I want to get to. The actual physical action of laughter can be demonstrated to have a physiological effect, which is positive, even in quite serious illnesses. However, when you attempt to isolate that from the humour itself, what's been interesting is that there's been follow-up studies, you'll be happy to know, that demonstrated that the human mind can't be fooled by false laughter. So while mm. your body might respond in similar ways to certain activities that resemble laughter. It only leads to cynicism. <laughs> <laughs> no, your brain. If, so if we're talking this about... This kind of yoga <laughs> only leads to cynicism because your mind knows that you're trying to trick your whole self and For it's just not working. For the listener, Renee was using air quotes there. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. Ironically. <laughs> We, so sometimes, I mean, we've talked about possibly broadcasting this in video form. Sometimes I really wish we were yeah, that's <laughs> because right. the level of the cynicism. But, but really, how this. far have we come from actually understanding what comedy is then? Because yeah. comedy in the ancient and medieval and Renaissance world, comedy was the form of drama where you got this whole sense of the way that there's a cosmic order to things right. that needs to be constantly restored. So the Shakespearean kind of um, model of comedy is that everything starts like really in a storm and, and things are all messed up. And then by the end, there's a resolution. Right. There's mm. usually a marriage and it's this restoration of the whole cosmic and also political order. So the Tempest is like that. It right. starts with a storm 
everything just goes terribly wrong. There's all sorts of comedy and that mm-hmm. kind of boardiness and everything else like that. But then there's a full restoration. Yeah. Whereas mm-hmm. tragedy is when everything kind of seems okay and then it just spirals out of control right. and everything is disordered. Yeah. So um, if you're saying that laughter can be dissociated from an actual understanding of what reality is about, I find that extremely problematic. Yeah. That we should not be laughing at things that are not <laughs> joyful <laughs> and are not just funny yeah because they're ridiculous or some of the things that we find amusing though i mean there's probably time to talk about this is some of the things we find amusing i'm constantly surprised at what tickles my fancy i was saying just before we came on air that one of the videos which i know would really annoy me if it happened to me absolutely it would be annoying but the people who go to the beach and in those beach showers they're in their their swimming costume <laughs> so it's not at all um lewd but basically they get they put the shampoo on and they're washing their hair and some trickster leans over the top when they're not looking and puts a little extra shampoo in their hair and they constantly <laughs> trying to wash this shampoo out and they get more and more frustrated as they, they, they get soapier and soapier. And they're wasting water. And they're wasting water. <laughs> and th- their reaction, for some reason, and I, I, I know it would really annoy me if it was me, but for some reason watching their reactions nearly makes me hurt myself laughing. And I, I, I'm, it's wrong in terms of their, my taking amusement at someone else's discomfort, but it's hilarious. <laughs> uh, the other, some some skits, for example, like a, I don't know if, if anyone's ever seen the Scottish Elevator skit where they I can't even remember the comedy duo. We'll have to put it in the show notes, but there's a comedy duo in Scotland um, who did a skit called the Scottish Elevator where they get into a voice-activated elevator and it oh, doesn't yeah. do Scottish accents. <laughs> <laughs> and they're trying to trying to talk to it and it's saying, please speak your destination. And they're going, 11. And this is an incredibly hilarious exchange. And when the, finally they've escalated, quite reasonably, you think, in the lift up to the point where they're screaming at the ceiling and, you know, screaming out um, Scotland and all this sort of stuff. And then the lift's open and people are wide. <laughs> so it's, anyway, that one really takes my fancy as well. But they're... It's, I can't watch American comedy in general because it's almost always awkward comedy and I, it, awkward comedy just makes me feel awkward. I can't do it. So my daughter tried to get me to watch Big Bang Theory last night. I, I struggled through about an episode of that and went, uh, See, I could see myself as one of those characters. <laughs> <laughs> that's what makes me feel awkward. <laughs> that's what makes me laugh. I'm like, yeah, that's me, and that's pretty funny. I can see now why. <laughs> ABC. <laughs> but it's like watching um, the British and American versions of yeah. something. Like yeah. I, I, I can watch the British shows of some things. And the Office. Oh, yeah, I don't like Ricky, oh, that's Ricky more Gervais. Canadian. But um, yeah. I love the uh, British, British um, panel comedy. Oh, yeah. So, like, the comedy shows like. Um, would I lie to you? Um, mock the week. These panel shows where the comedians get together and have quite serious conversations about politics, but at the same time do it in a completely humorous way. And it really does bring out, and their sharpness of wit is on, in evidence there. It's quite dark because it's British and Scottish and Irish, and so it's going back and forth quite darkly, but it is actually quite incisive and cutting, and you can appreciate the wit. But in, in the American versions, it tends to be about awkwardness and the, and the kind of the... Uh, slightly more obvious puns. I don't know. It just doesn't do it for me, whereas my kids really love it. They really mm. get into it. So mm. it's, it's intriguing what we find funny. Well, it's interesting as well that the role that humour plays in our socialization with others. Right. Um, I, I watch certain videos on, on YouTube that, that talk about charisma and, and really, you know, public speaking and things like that. And they're saying that people with uh, quicker wit... And people who are seen to be able to laugh at themselves and laugh at almost any situation um, are people that tend to be, uh, others tend to gravitate towards them more. Right. And so a, a good grasp on humor, I think, not uh, showing that they don't have to take everything seriously, but right. still have the capacity to take things seriously. It's interesting you say community because uh, one of the studies on laughter was by Bryant and um That study indicated, in fact, she was trying to say that it was an evolutionary issue, that Mm -hmm. laughter actually binds a group together. And when a group is Mm -hmm. bound together by positive experiences, they're much more likely to defend themselves. I I don't like how everyone makes everything into evolutionary stuff, but Mm -hmm. basically that it actually is a kind of a a social cohesion mechanism, a Mm -hmm. natural way for communities to bound together, even if they're not um, related, that if they share Mm -hmm. that kind of experience, they can actually become like a unit or a tribe or something like that. 
it's a big business though. Um, laughter itself or yeah. comedy, if you like, is a huge business. So I had a quick look at the top 10 earners in comedy. Um, the top 10 list for this year, um, so far, Kevin Hart's uh, at 59 million intake directly from sales from his either his shows or his CDs or whatever, the DVDs or whatever. Jerry Seinfeld's uh, dropped from number one to number two this year to 40 something million. And Jim Gaffigan, the humble Jim Gaffigan's up to 30 million um, oh. for this year alone. Uh, last year he was in this just under 20 million. So, you, I mean, this is big business. Mm. Mm. Now, when you think they're, they're big, and then of course I went, hang on, behind any performer that's making money there's some executive somewhere making it well the big names in comedy in terms of the producers some of them are, are clocking you know two billion in sales this year alone wow. it's just an astounding industry this seems to have bl you know, bloomed like when you look back at the figures it, it wasn't this big 10 years ago the comedy industry if you like has become a big thing mm -hmm. and netflix specials and things like that have mm -hmm. contributed to that in another episode on uh, mental health, we talked about laughter as a kind of a coping mechanism. Maybe the fact that mental health has degenerated so much in the last little while has, has influenced the fact that people turn to comedy a lot more. Mm. Mm. So w what effect does social media have on laughter? Like m my kids are consistently saying lol and roffle out loud. <laughs> you go, you say something to them, they go lol. You go, you almost laughed then. <laughs> as in it, it almost matched what you actually said. <laughs> Why not just laugh or giggle or go, huh? Oh, because you have to be ironic. You can't actually laugh, right? <laughs> so you think lol is not actually lol? It's a, it's a laughter? If you're saying lol, which is supposed to be a shorthand for not having to write laughing out loud and is supposed to be a substitute for actual laughter, which people can't hear, right? The, and you're saying it in conversation, surely it has to be ironic. <laughs> I mean, that's something that my daughter would do to me. She'd just say lol because she knows that there are so many reasons why I think that that is wrong. <laughs> You know, oh yeah, I would be laughing, Mum, but actually, I'm just giving you a weird acronym that kind of means laughter, but really doesn't in this other, otherworldly yeah. realm. Yeah. It's usually what I get when I tell a dad joke. Lol. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I still, I still type ha 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 ha. <laughs> um, I, I got this compliment. I admire you. For yeah. that. Thank you. <laughs> I, I got this compliment in high school from from a friend that said, when you type. Your laughter, I actually hear it. Yeah. You in particular box, I can hear it yeah. when you laugh. And I thought that, that's cool. I yeah. like it when someone writes, uh, wah, 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 wah. <laughs> or uh, meh. <laughs> yeah, it's so much better than LOL because you're getting the kind of laughter yeah, in there yeah. as well. Mm. Yeah. There's yeah. A, in, um, when I was gaming, um, when you played online war games and you played against, I think it's Thailand, I'm not sure. One of the languages in, in that area of uh, Asia, the number five is pronounced ha. And so when I couldn't figure it out at one stage, why people were covering the screen with fives, like five, 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 and you go, what? And apparently, because it's it's that ha, in that ha, particular ha, ha, language, yeah. it's a quick way of saying ha, 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 ha. So they see fives across the screen in certain, like when you're shooting That's someone, great. you get shot in the head and there are these fives. You go, ah, oh, right, okay, thanks for that. Um, in terms of um, making something funny, uh, I've seen that bleed from their social media into what they find funny. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if they're not laughing out loud until they're looking at some video on their screen or something like that. Mm -hmm. But in terms of actually what we find funny in person, there, there's still that discordance. Like I found it funny. I grew up in a household where we played practical jokes on each other all the time. It was constant. And I found it hilarious, for example, when you were playing practical jokes, when you're putting powder in someone's bed or, you, you know, you did something weird to the hat or something, not that it was irreparable when they were about to go for a job or something, but just silly little inconvenient things. But my wife didn't find it quite so hilarious when in our first week of marriage, I put a little glass of cold water on top of the shower that when she got into the shower, it came off the shower head and fell on her. Um, she let me know very clearly that this, uh, that she didn't share my mm. <laughs> sense of humor in that area. In fact, she made it clear using a jug. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, we have not. We have been very clear on that subject ever since. I'd just like to say, <laughs> but it was interesting to me having to sort of align our senses of humour in such a way that it's it's very important, as I tell my kids now, that everybody's laughing. Mm -hmm. That you, when you think something's hilarious, it should be that everyone everyone does. is laughing. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny you say that. There's um, there are a couple of channels on YouTube. Right. That they've become famous and earn a lot of money just because it's the the husband, the wife, or you know that the the two of them pranking each other. 
Right. Through the, you know, every week you find a major prank they've done to each other, like shaved each other's hair or something. Oh, good know. grief. Um, and I, I personally, I don't think I could ever be in that kind of relationship <laughs> where, you know, like you don't know if what you're eating is actually safe to eat. Oh, <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. But um, I remember trying to put, um, this was the kind of house I was in, but we, my dad hated eating chilies and oh. we grew them in the garden, right? So they were, <laughs> we had the real, like not the frozen stuff or not the sort of dried stuff you get in the shops. Like, I don't know if anyone's, actually picked a chili off a thing you can't even wipe your face yeah. after picking <laughs> yeah. touching a chili we would take the seeds of the chili directly from the plant while it was still there and put one seed inside a salad sandwich in a tomato <laughs> of my father's sandwich and he'd check out because he was so suspicious he'd check out the sandwich like <laughs> what's <laughs> going on in there but he, all he would see was tomato seeds and everything arranged and then get a blast of chili we thought that was hilarious um clearly we grew up in a household that was Constant sadistic. prankery. <laughs> yes, <Was sadistic>. <laughs> <laughs> I remember in um, in high school, I used to get my um, my my recess constantly taken off me by by the bullies. But so one night, I actually stayed up. I also grew chili trees, and I I opened a pack of Oreos. I took out every single one of them and scraped out just the center of the cream. Oh, so wow. the out, the ring there was still a ring of cream on the outside. Right. And I filled it with fresh chili. Oh, beautiful. And then I I put everything back <laughs> except for the very first one. And so when the bullies came back the next day and said, "Oh, those Oreos?" I said, "Please just let me have at least one." And I ate the first one and it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the funniest things I've ever, ever seen. <laughs> they all ran off to the bathroom with red faces and tears in their eyes. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I enjoyed that. Mm. <laughs> well, that's a good one. See, my mum thought that was hilarious. When, when she, we knew we were stealing the cordial from the fridge. We were sculling it directly from the bottle. She put dishwashing detergent. Oh. <laughs> and she, she thought, oh, I've told them not to do it several times. I've smacked them and I've found them. But yeah. no, well, they're going to learn the hard way. So, bloop. <laughs> Which is probably poisonous in some way. Mm. But there's You're when, still here. Yeah. We survived <laughs> just. <laughs> there were so many bad jokes. I'm gonna remember them as we go. But the the whole idea about laughter, I think it's important to note that it, laughter is good when you're all able to laugh. Mm. So when when you're not laughing with someone, you're probably laughing at them. Terry Pratchett, who is one of my absolute favorite authors, he's not only one of the best comedians I've ever read and um, he's just got the, the incredibly intelligent way of analysing mm. a situation in real life and satirising it in his books. But he's also an incredibly philosophical thinker. So he's yeah. he's very, very deep in the way he analyses these situations. But he, he made a very good point saying, laughter is a weapon. You're either using it to take down an oppressor or to poke fun at an oppressor, or you are oppressing. Mm. So it's, it's very rare that you're there somewhere in between you're either having a go at the, those in power or those who are bullies or you're taking fun at yourself in a sort of a therapeutic way or, or a good healthy way or you're oppressing someone it was, mm -hmm. it was an interesting thing it's interesting but it's quite utilitarian it is i i actually think that laughter can just be a good in itself right. and an yeah. appreciation that that life is good mm -hmm. and that there are certain things that are good and there doesn't have to be anything beyond that so to say that it's being used as a mm. as some kind of tool you know with your the laughter therapy yoga people <laughs> um or the <laughs> you really got to <laughs> think about yoga <laughs> i do have a think about yoga because I'm, I'm watching um generations of otherwise intelligent people mm. who um having their spirituality hijacked by thinking mm. that they're just going in for something so that i shouldn't is, mention the podcast that's like philosophy and yoga um, no. <laughs> is that a real thing? Yes. Mike, yes. tell me it's not for real. <laughs> <laughs> traitor, traitor. Um, no, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not with Pratchett on that one. Okay. I think you're right. I, I mentioned him because um, his, his view of humour is quite cynical. So he's, yeah. he's quite a dry, dark humour. And I think that comes from his own background and his own understanding. Interestingly, he says himself... Uh, he wonders what his life would have been like had he met a decent theologian before the age of 19. Because mm. uh, he met philosophers who were atheist and quite cynical yeah. and he went down that path. Yeah. Now, he's, he's, some of his books are quite theological and quite deep in their reflections mm -hmm. and he kind of pokes fun at his own atheism in mm. a sense, which is something quite rare in, mm. in that anyone prepared to poke fun at their own beliefs. Um, I recommend... <laughs> Unlike Catholics because we never make fun of ourselves. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Honestly, it's one constant joke. Um but the you're right. There's there is an expression of sheer joy, an mm. unbridled, pure nature of joy and happiness, which seems to 
uh, be absent from a lot of modern ideas of humor. Yeah. Uh, it, but it's difficult to find someone who's who's just purely joyful in terms of comedy, like they're making a living out of comedy. I, I'm trying to think. Jim Gaffigan's quite clean in his humor, but he's still taking a, a poke at white trash, basically. He's mm. constantly having a go at himself and his own sort of uh, white trash, which is healthy because they're almost the only safe target in the US that's left. In terms of he doesn't get into trouble. Um, perhaps that's a good time to mention others who have gotten into trouble. So someone like Dave Chappelle, for example, has gotten absolutely canned by the Rotten Tomatoes and the critics, everything, but his listening audience have rated him in the, like 99, 100% quarter of range. So everyone who listens to him loves him, or at least maybe they're reacting against the critics, but the critics are canning him because he's more or less offended, I think, everyone it's possible to offend these days. So he's had to go at all kinds of communities which would normally be, you know, you, oh, you don't offend those. Mm-hmm. Um, he's gone down for them deliberately, in a sense, uh, as a reaction to the rea- to the prior reactions to his shows. Just to be clear, I'm not advocating Dave Chappelle's humour. I, I find a lot of it offensive myself, but I just don't watch it if I don't like mm-hmm. it. Like I'm just wondering about the reaction to humour. Mm. John Cleese has made the point that humor, all humour is offensive. He thinks... Now, there's another one to react against because <laughs> he thinks all humor is offensive because otherwise it's not funny. He thinks if if uh, you're just pretending everything's okay, and I think he's got another problem with cynicism there. Yeah, but I wonder what he means by offensive in that respect. Mm. I mean, I'm thinking of Faulty Towers and Monty Python and all this kind of thing. A lot of it is just fun. Yeah, mm. it's silliness though. But I mean, Yeah, silliness. But I know sure. Catholics who won't watch Monty Python at all because they said it's mm. blasphemous. And I look yeah. at it and go... Well, it's got God in it, and he says some pretty stupid things, but every other character in the whole thing says say stupid things. I mean, honestly, the holy hand of grenade of Antioch <laughs> makes me wet myself as a scripture scholar when they're reading out the scriptures on how to use the holy hand grenade of Antioch, and two shall be the number of counting. <laughs> I still, when someone says one, two, three, I'm, I can't resist the, the, the rest of that line. Um, it, well, sorry, I'd have to say a, a brief aside on this. A friend of mine told me a story about their child who went to a very, very, um, like a priest's catechetical session. He was quite a serious priest and he was trying to show an icon of Our Lady and Our Lady had the orb in one hand and the rod in the other. And he said, what's the orb in her hand? And the child said, is it the holy hand grenade? I bet our lady does have a holy hand grenade too. I nearly died laughing. Uh, I wasn't there, but when I heard of it, it was just hilarious because I also know this priest and he's not a priest known for his humour in the middle of catechetical sessions. It was just hilarious to think of this. This child was so young and innocent. Is it the holy hand grenade? Yeah. All the other kids are looking around saying, we get hand grenades? This is cool. <laughs> I'm so, so much more interested in this catechetical yeah. lesson. Oh, dear. But I think humour as well, I think, as you were saying, Renee, that you know this this natural part of our life, which is joy and and laughter. Uh, bringing it back to an earlier point that that uh, I made was, um, it sort of shows a way in which we can deal with those things that are out of the norm, or things that surprise us, or things that uh, we encounter in life mm. that we can mm. sort of react one way or another. I mean, I remember talking to my uncle in the Philippines once, and I said, "Look, all these friends of mine say that because I'm Filipino, I've just got very corny humour." And we're just too corny. What do you say about this? He said, well, we have to have corny. We have to be able to laugh at anything because look around you. Yeah. We're over 80% of our population is in the poverty line, yeah. below right. the poverty line. If we couldn't just laugh about things, where do you think we'd be? Yeah, that's right. And I think there is something to that. The, the, able, the ability to look at where you are and, and, and just laugh at things that yeah. come along. Yeah. And what laughter does is that it gives perspective. I think really good mm. laughter gives perspective. Like, it's not that serious. Mm. Is it Chesterton who said the good thing about angels is that they take themselves very lightly <laughs> and that we should be doing that as well? You know? Well, I mean, he also says that uh, the good sign of a healthy religion is one that can mock itself. Yeah. Uh, which is, mm. yeah, I think that's a good thing. I mean, when people aren't open to laughing about Catholicism, and even when, I mean... I still feel hurt when I hear, and almost every comedian in the last 10 years has made a joke about priests um, and pedophilia or something like that. Mm. And it hurts because I, that's a real issue that really mm. hurts. And I'm, you know, I've spoken with people who've been victims, and, and it's not something we should just be banning around and joking. However, just like um, uh, is raised in, by the Jay Chappelle incidents, 
there can't be off limits for human, I don't think. Like John Cleese was right about this. I don't think there's a limit to where humour can go. There, if, if a comedian steps over the line, by all means, we should say you've stepped over the line, absolutely. But shutting them down forever after that, you know, that, mm. that's, we've almost got to test that and we've almost got to bring it out there and really be able to laugh about it. Otherwise, I mean, when someone jokes about Nazis these days, it's off limits. What, too soon? You know, you, there's got to be a point at which we can have a laugh about something so long as it's not at someone's expense. Yeah. And the, the point about, I think, the Nazi thing is that we are most of the time that's usually at someone's expense and there's still not the sensitivity there that should be there. But what about laughing about Catholics? Have, can you think of something that's actually amusing in terms of having a poke at Catholics? Oh, there are some great Catholic jokes. Such as? Oh, I was just talking about one last night. I'm terrible at, at telling jokes, but there is um, someone comes and asks a Dominican a Franciscan and a <laughs> Jesuit if it's okay for them to pray a novena about whether they should buy a Ferrari or a Porsche. Oh dear. So the Dominican says, well, what's a Ferrari? And the Franciscan says, well, what's a Porsche? And the Jesuit says, well, what's a novena? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, if we had a Jesuit friend sitting in our room with us, would he be laughing with us? Um, really good Jesuits would be laughing <laughs> with us. I've well, told that one to a Jesuit before. I, I, um, there are some fantastic Jesuits out there, so yes. I'm not saying. But, um, you know, and I'm sure there are some Dominicans who know about nice cars. Mm. And Francisco I was told that joke by a Jesuit. Oh, so yeah? at oh, the yeah. time, it was completely appropriate because yeah, he was right. the one telling me. But that's uh, right. Yes, uh, it was funny that a, a Dominican also told me a joke about Dominicans and said uh, a man, you know, was skydiving and got stuck up in a, as he landed, his parachute got tangled up in a tree and he was hanging from a tree. And he, he saw a religious brother walking through and he said, where am I? And the religious brother called up and says, you're in a tree. <laughs> and he says, you must be a Dominican. <laughs> says, How did you know? He says, because everything you've told me is true and absolutely useless. <laughs> anyway. All right. Um, in terms of uh, laughing about Catholics, we'd, when I was a Protestant, we told a lot of jokes about Catholics, but the intention was to, to mock them. So, But now, it's interesting when I tell them now, I'm mocking myself mm. and I actually find it funny. Like, so we used to mock about Catholic aerobics, which was an attempt to mock the, the physical movement in the Catholic mass. So when I was a Protestant, you sat down, you stood up for hymns, but pretty much you sat down for everything else. Whereas Catholics were always standing and kneeling and genuflecting and bowing and going up the front and you know, turning around. There's all kinds. They basically call it Catholic aerobics. It's the only exercise I get all week. No. <laughs> <laughs> and look, I don't mind that, but th that joke's been a very old one. The whole song Hokey Pokey is, in fact, a poke at Catholics because it's it, Hokey Pokey is a, is a sort of mangling hocus of pocus. Hocus, hocus yeah. corpus maum, mm. which is the, the, you know, this is my body. And the whole ritual is a mockery of the Catholic mass. You know, you do the Hokey Pokey and you turn around. Mm. It's the whole physical nature of the... Um, because most people weren't aware of what was going on at the front, and so they mocked it. Okay, but we can take that as a kind of a gentle poke at the, the ritual side and go, yeah, okay, fair enough, we need to explain it better. Mm. Or you can go, oh, I'm so mortally offended because now I'm sure that I've told someone that, that they're all going to tell their kids not to sing that song. Our kids sing the song, I'm fine with it. You know, it's just a bit of fun. Um, sometimes you have to make something a bit more joyful when you – when you critique it, like they've been doing it with nursery rhymes forever. A lot of the nursery rhymes are quite dark, mm. but they're fun. You know, they've made it into something fun, so it's a lesson as well as that. It's interesting. Um, there's a movie that came out in the 90s called Dogma, which is uh, directed by Kevin Smith, and um, I watched it. I thought it was pretty funny. At the very beginning, though, he put a disclaimer about the humour, at which point, I think it was that movie, he, he mentions, well, God obviously has a sense of humour. Mm. He created the platypus. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, it was, it, it was interesting that I, I don't think he prescribes to Christianity or anything like that, but that mm. there's that commentary at the beginning he acknowledges, uh, and it is all meant to be humour. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, I think, well, again, going back to the Simpika Fisher episode, she talked about humour as being a proper and appropriate response to the absurd. Mm. And that mm. if something's absurd or, or seems to not make sense with us, we can almost, uh, the only response, the only appropriate response is either despair or laughter. And in some cases, they're very much <laughs> mixed along there. Um, why not laugh about things? And especially the, the sheer joy of laughter doesn't have to be when everything's 100% fine. Like I, mm. I, it's often in my darkest days that I'll get home and 
you know, my son will just come up to me and give me something really, really small or stupid. And I, I just laugh because I can't help it. It's just such a beautiful shining thing in the midst of an otherwise dark day. It's mm. a beautiful thing. Yeah. What about shared laughter as building community though? Um, making a deliberate attempt to hang out. So I find it's different if I'm watching something myself that I find funny. And I'm trying to giggle to myself mm. and uh, my wife tells me off for reading Pratchett. I'm not allowed to read Pratchett when I'm yeah, lying in bed with her because the whole bed shakes from my suppressed laughter <laughs> <laughs> quite late into the night. So I have to read Pratchett on the train or something, which makes all the other people on the train very weirded out. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're actually laughing with people, like you, we're watching The Good Place with my, with a couple of my um, children, It's there's something really beautiful about shared mm. laughter. I found that as, uh, as well that in those situations when you're in a group of, with a group of people, that you tend to laugh at things more, mm. as in it's almost like your your level of level of humour is is lowered, and you're just willing to laugh a bit more. Yeah, the more people there are, the more you laugh. It's, it's kind of you had to be there thing in some yeah. cases. You t- yeah. If you retold the joke, it wouldn't work. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. there's a kind of contagion with laughter as well. Yeah. Like once things really start rolling, yeah, everything <laughs> just seems funny. Yeah, and when it's someone's sharp nice. and they have a cre- really sharp response or a really quick connection to something, sometimes it's funny just because you're appreciating the sharpness of their wit. Yeah. It's not actually an amusing thing in itself. Yeah. Yeah. That's what the British chat shows tend to to come up with the, the really quick-witted responses mm, tend yeah. to really work. Yeah. Um, I think there's something very healing and therapeutic about it, but also community building. Yeah, Because if, we, if we're – what I've noticed about ser- communities that are constantly serious about everything is that it's too easy to fragment. Yeah. Yeah. The smallest yeah. thing can actually fragment. If you're c- capable of laughing at yourself, even at the very things that are the centre of community – you're, it gives a buffer zone, a kind of a protection zone against that kind of thing undermining the community. Yeah. And if you can laugh at yourself and laugh at any jibes, you're also protected a little bit from the, the nastiness that comes in. What about, and this is a bit more controversial, laughter in the mass. So laughing, perhaps I find myself, and this is probably tipping my head a little bit, sometimes if some something a little bit amusing or a little bit quirky happens in a mass, I'll have a quiet giggle to myself. And it's my natural reaction against something absurd or awkward. I don't see anything wrong with it, but I know people who think it's completely inappropriate. This is mm. a deeply solemn moment and it, uh-huh. you can't be completely laughing. Or if I see a young child sticking their tongue out at me from three rows ahead, I'll, I can't help laughing, not out loud, but just mm. in terms of a, uh, a feeling of joy that they're there. Um, even someone who's, you know, slightly messes things up, like yeah. when I mess up the, the words of a particular part of the mess or something, mm. I have a giggle at myself. It's just... But, what about in um, the hum- in the homily? Yeah, I mean, some of the most memorable uh, masses I've been to, uh, it, it's because the homily was quite delightful, and it right. wasn't. It was it was serious, but it was able to laugh, and it, it brought the message across um, in a way that involved humour. Mm-hmm. You know, and um, I think there's something to it because it shows that our faith allows that part of us. Mm. Um, and it allows that in the understanding of the gospel and breaking down how we live this stuff, that humor is part of our life. Yeah. I remember there's a homily that I remember um, still from when I was a kid just because of a moment that it brought about. So the the priest was making the point that people shouldn't be so obsessed about money. So he was using this rhetorical device where he just kept on saying money, money, money. So he did this a few times and then a kid from up the back just said money, money, <laughs> money. And everyone laughed, including the priest. And it kind of lightened the air a little bit, but yeah. it still sticks in my mind as one of these moments of everyone being together and thinking about mm. what he was saying and a little kid kind of picking up on yep. this as well. So it's a nice yeah, My son... We were in a mass uh, in a very, very small setting. I'm wondering if I can say, tell this story without revealing where it was. Basically, it was the current Bishop of Sydney, before he was a bishop, was leading the mass. And he is a Dominican, so he was preaching slightly longer than the average Catholic priest. <laughs> and my son was sitting with us in the front row of what was effectively about a 10-seat chapel. Very tightly, you know, lots of people in there, but... You know, it's echoey and everything. And he was preaching. He got to about the 15, 20 minute mark. And my son stood up. And it was one of those moments as a parent where you go, you know, he's going to say something and you try and reach for his mouth, but you don't quite get there in time. And he says, at the top of his voice, standing on the pew about two rows away from the pulpit, this is boring. <laughs> And we're mortified and we've hustled him into the seat and uh, the, 
the, the refreshing the, honesty of a child. And the priest, yes. the priest manfully struggled on. But what was even more hilarious, and it cracked me up completely, is that priest's best friend in the front row turns around to Isaac, my son, and gave him the thumbs up <laughs> <laughs> in full view of his friend's <laughs> preaching. <laughs> and the entire place is stifling laughter oh. and the hilarious. And I can't remember the homily, but I remember that, that incident. Um, Humour can also break down tense moments. So, for example, uh, Mike was mentioning earlier about uh, tense business meetings where a little spark of humour actually isn't that funny, but it breaks down the tension to have a laugh together. I was one of um, my wife's uncles is a psychoanalyst in um, South Australia, and he's telling me that frequently in situations where people have a shared tension, so like a nursing school or a boarding school or something like that, where there's an intense lead up to an exam or something, the smallest trigger, the most absurd little trigger can start people um, running with a particular emotion like laughter or sometimes crying and it's just a surge which you can't resist and the response is so primal in its in its um, outlet that you people feel great afterwards because they've let loose in this yeah. hilarious laughter. I remember in the middle of a Greek intensive, we'd gone four and a half weeks of nine to five um, intensive Greek and lots of homework and we were so distressed, almost all of us were in tears with how hard it was and then somebody, I can't even remember the joke, it wasn't that funny, but we lost Just it. Just lost it. We yeah. lost it so bad I actually pulled muscles in my stomach <laughs> laughing. And it was it was about the relief. It was about the situation finally having a release in itself. Oh, one of my best friends, she was a Canadian, so our producer will appreciate this. When we were in the middle of a very intense exam period um, in my undergraduate, she painted half of her face blue and ran down into the cafeteria and screamed, Freedom! <laughs> 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 and everyone burst out laughing, and I think it got us through the entire exam period. <laughs> in in one particular homily, the the humour is a little bit Catholic, so you kind of have to go know the Catholic traditions here to understand it. But it, I remember it vividly because it was one of the most traditionalist style priests who'd just been ordained, and he'd had this like he'd invited all of his friends, and they all had to wear their most sort of posh traditionalist um, priest outfits. There was lots of lace. Yeah, and they were all wearing berettas yeah, so okay. in the mass. So there's these very fancy liturgical hats. And then he preached, but when he was preaching, the homily itself demanded, like the texts demanded speaking about the name of God mm. and the name of specifically Jesus Christ. And there is a, a formality that's required if you're wearing a liturgical hat that whenever someone mentions the name of Jesus, they have to tip their hat. Mm. And there was a row of them, about five of them on the one side. And he very, you know, very, uh, oh, the word pompous is coming up to mind. It wasn't like that. It was kind of very formally stepped up. There and was pomp and circumstance. And, and he starts his homily and that each time he just kept, because normally Catholics avoid it. They say our Lord or something like that. But because it was a homily about name of Jesus he just kept dropping the name <laughs> and, the, and the priests on the side had kind of slipped into the mode of okay we're not doing anything now we can kind of just relax into the homily and they're like oh. <laughs> and they, they each had to take the you know tip tip the hat at the name of Christ. and he, he just kept doing it it was and because we could see it coming and they would they eventually clued into this and they knew he was taunting them they had to go through with it because the whole point of this mass it was so formal and very yeah. strictly catholic and he was it was he wasn't being mean. He was just trolling them, basically, yeah. for the homily. It was completely legitimate. But it, I, I I lost count at 20 times that he'd mentioned this name and then all tipping their hats. Afterwards, they were very they were scolding him quite sternly afterwards. It was hilarious. The entire congregation, who were all quite sympathetic to the trad sort of thing, were laughing about it. Now, I didn't expect them to laugh because they're, they're not usually known for laughing about their own liturgy, but it was just perfectly done. It was a perfect mm -hmm. scenario. Mm. That brings a question, though, and something that's come up in a lot of – the uh, Catholic circles, I mean, is would Jesus have had a good sense of humour? I think he did. I mean, he had nicknames for two of his disciples. How could you be Jewish and not have a good sense of humour? <laughs> well, I mean, he called two of his disciples the sons of thunder, which literally mm. in Hebrew means incarnations of thunder. Mm. So he's saying, it's like my mum used to call the grumpy kids, you know, little thunderclouds. Mm. So when, it, when he's prepared to mock his disciples, and a couple of other times he he seems to mock them. But, I mean, God's sense of humour all through the Bible, we've talked about this in past episodes, is is there. Genesis 2, where mm -hmm. God creates Adam and Eve, um, we see 
Adam brought all the animals directly after God saying, it's not good that man's alone. I will make a helper fit for him and then brings him all the animals. <laughs> and then it says, but no suitable helper for Adam was found. Like it's all tongue in cheek humor because then, you know, you have the image of Adam saying, oh no, none of these animals work for me. They better make something else. And God makes the woman. Um, there's a, there's humor in, in Job, sarcastic humor, and there's humor almost all the way through the Bible. It's just humor is definitely yeah. part of God's makeup. I mean, what's fascinated me a lot in my art in depicting Christ is the fact that he hung out with 12 of his closest mates for three years, um, you know, camping out, you know, <laughs> and the wilderness at night, taking turns watching, you know. Just imagine the conversations they would have had, the jokes. Uh, it, it's something that I really, I think, is is, is quite interesting. Um, and if he didn't have that sense of humor, would it have really worked? Held together yeah. as much? How could they talk about joy in the mm. way they did without having yeah. an example of that from Christ? How could they possibly talk about genuine, pure um, love for other people without having a sense of um, the absurdity of you know mm. the situation and being able to have fun with it? Yeah, I, I honestly think that laughter is essential for Catholicism. Or yeah. for any human life, but I think it's actually essential to be able to laugh at things, and especially ourselves. If you take yourself far too seriously, it can actually be damaging. Yeah, mm. one of the problems I had with the Ignatian retreats is that I'm already melancholic and I'm already self-critical. And when I went on a forty-day retreat to carve myself to pieces in the Ignatian way, maybe I had a bad leader of that particular retreat. <laughs> it just made me much worse. You needed to have a sense of humor about your own flaws, otherwise you end up you know, just destroying yourself. Um, and it also helps you, eases you into being able to deal with other people's flaws too, if mm -hmm. you can have a sense of humour about it. In the Philippines, when I grew up, priests almost always had this um, air about them. We had to, I think people tended to, to worship priests um, almost. Just There was, you know, it was there's so much, mm. they were put up on such a pedestal. And one of the things that I found that brought me closer in my faith uh, is encountering priests, uh, priests, <laughs> priests uh, was in, encountering priests that w could actually laugh at themselves, mm. yes. could t tell jokes, and and show that they were just yeah everyday human beings. I have a priest friend who constantly jokes about him his own status as a priest, as if it were you know he kind of says, "Well, you you know that this is one of the graces of the sacrament. You get to discern between cheeses." <laughs> <laughs> He's constantly mocking this idea that priests know everything by. Yeah over-exaggerating it. It's yeah. quite a clever way of, of dealing with it. Uh, and it's worth testing these things with humour constantly because we, mm. you're right, in the, in, not just in the Philippines, that we had an unrealistic view of priests. Yeah. In Whenever you think, it's interesting, again, a Pratchett thing, if you want to, no, it wasn't Pratchett. Who was it who said this? If you want to know who is oppressing you, figure out who you're not allowed to laugh at. Mm -hmm. It sounds like something Orwell would say, but yeah, I wonder if it was. It's, it's not Orwell. I'm just trying to think of who it was. I'll have to I'll have to find that one and put it in the show notes. But if you want to know who your oppressors are, figure out who you're not allowed to laugh at. Now, that's something that's interesting in today's society because there are some minorities uh, these days who you're all absolutely forbidden to have a laugh at. Yeah. And so apparently Catholics aren't oppressing anyone because we're fair game. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone's having a go at Catholics. And in a sense, um, it's probably a backhanded compliment because we're the last recognisable kind of religious group in terms of standing for anything, you know, they're, mm. they're still mocking us. Um, I haven't seen a lot of people mocking uh, various other types of religions these days, possibly because they're minorities now. Mm. Um, but the fact that Catholics are still fair game, I don't like it because it's constantly being butt of jokes. But, you know, they're still talking about us. Mm. We, I mean, we have much more media coverage than anyone else because they're mocking us or deriding us. Um, it's not a good thing. But one day, who knows? I mean, some people have actually come to Catholicism by finding out the, the, via this method that uh, they aren't quite as bad as they said. Not being able to, to laugh at someone, there's a good and a bad to it. So, for example, there's a good reason why it's become t taboo, for example, to mock Indigenous people. Because I remember the jokes that were told in my high school, which, by the way, I called out back then, but... Um, they were told in my high school with impunity, they were horrible. They were racist. They were worse than racist. They were uh, treating Indigenous people as less than human and therefore should be struck off. Mm -hmm. But if someone who's Indigenous makes a joke about their own their own culture in their own way, I, I, it's not the same thing, I don't think. And mm -hmm. it's interesting in America you can find certain comedians can get away with saying things about um, 
communities. Like Chris Rock can make jokes about black people being racist. Um, and it works in a way that I, there's no way any other comedian could do it uh, mm. who wasn't from the same community. Um, yeah, I, I wonder if you know, if that's a guide. I don't know. I mean, there are places in Australia, almost nothing you can criticise now. Mm. I, I, I told a couple of jokes about Catholics and everyone was fine with it. And then I told a Protestant joke and I was told it was, uh, yeah, no, no, not appropriate. Uh, I was kind of mocking myself there. <laughs> there's, a, no. there's a comedian on, on uh, YouTube and uh, his name is Jokoy. He's Filipino American, and every week he does on Thursdays he drops a video saying it's called Tagalog Thursdays, and he teaches one Tagalog word, and What's gives Tagalog, examples. Sorry, Tagalog is the national language of the Philippines. Right. Okay. And um, it, it's funny because for for those of us who are Filipino, we watch that and think, oh, yeah, that that does mean that's pretty funny the way he. But most of the people that laugh at it when I share it on Facebook are actually the, the non-Filipinos. Oh, really? I just think it's, it's humorous. And, you know, it's it's this whole thing of, you know, well, hang on, that's absurd. Um, the way that things are carried out, like, for example, he, he shared this, uh, when someone is surprised by something, they they go, um, ay nako, which actually is is a slang for anak, which is my my child and so <laughs> it's it's easily exasperation of like oh look what my child's done but um it, it's become this whole thing of when you're shocked or when you're exasperated whatever and so he gave these examples on the video and mm. it was quite humorous and I, i'd never noticed it before he just illustrated it. Right. he showed it you know i think we got to remember that the the importance of humor in, in faith especially i know a lot of people that are agnostic or atheist and they are all attracted to even if they don't listen to um the pope because he seems like a very joyful person to them right his ability to laugh and to be with people yeah. right um having that joyful attitude is something that um as we said before is contagious something that people want as yeah. well i mean if we say we're catholic and spend the whole time moping right then it's not a very attractive thing either i've often wondered um what people must think about communion if you've received the gift of the king of kings and lord of lords and yet we all walk back from communion looking like we've just sucked a lemon because we're all trying to look so deeply you know meditative or pious or something Surely, in some circumstances, it's appropriate to beam with mm. joy from having received the gift to to even. I mean, I'm not talking about cartwheels in the aisle, but genuine joy and expression of um, like a joyful song after communion, which we often have. Mm. We just sort of uh, there's an assumption that seriousness equals um, holiness, solemnity, you know, yeah. or holiness. Yeah, no, no, holy, holy laughter perhaps is something we could mm. we could get more of. All right, that's probably a good place to wrap it up. Holy laughter. Um, that's it for this week's podcast. If anything in this discussion got you thinking, arguing, or hopefully laughing at your podcast device, let us know. You can subscribe to the podcast at our website, thiscatholiclife.com.au, or you can tell us what you liked, what you didn't like, what you'd like us to discuss in a future show by dropping us a line at info at thiscatholiclife.com.au. Thank you to those I've been talking to on email and on Facebook about these ideas. We are seriously considering them, putting them in the list of things to consider, and we'd love to hear from you about what you think we could talk about. Uh, you can continue the discussion, as we said, on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or Discord, or you can find all of the links of the things we talked about in today's show in our show notes. Be sure to write us a review on iTunes. Remember that this is a uniquely Australian Catholic podcast, and we think that's an idea worth getting behind. So now it's time for shout outs. Box. I want to shout out again to the uh, creative community that I've helped to form, uh, Praetorian Studios. We got a lot of exciting things happening and um yeah shout out to you guys i hope you guys are doing well and i'll see you soon awesome i'll do a shout out to everyone in uh, involved in the plenary council 2020 which is um rolling along there's a lot of hard work going into it and not only would i like to shout out to everyone but also to ask anyone who's listening to this podcast to pray for everyone involved amen mm -hmm. amen um i'm going to shout out to my friends, uh, there are three families which are very close to our family and the three guys in particular, the fathers of those families who I hang out with, they, I don't think I spend time with these guys without laughing or coming away smiling. And that is priceless. There is no way you can buy that with money. So thank you to you guys. Um, uh, you, I'm choking up just talking. <laughs> you, are, you are a genuine gem in my life. That's all for now. 
Thank you for listening to This Catholic Life. Thank you.